Well, please turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. I'm real excited about this passage. It's a glorious passage. And uh, so needed in our day with all the error and false teaching about who Christ is and that's out there. Uh, I hope that uh, <clears throat> you'll be able to leave this morning and very confident in uh, who we worship. Um, let me begin by reading the passage. We're looking at verses 15 to 20 of chapter 1, Colossians 1, 15 to 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Amen. Let's pray together. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, as we come to this text, Paul understands that there's a certain false teaching going on about Christ at the church in Colossae. Among other things, the false teachers of his day were denying the deity of Christ. They were saying that to trust in him alone, to rest in him alone for your salvation was not enough. That in addition to Christ, there must be the worship of other deities and spirits and angels they said you needed special vision, super knowledge, and so forth. And Paul addresses this kind of thinking. Look at verses 27 and 28 of this same chapter, where Paul says, To whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Paul says that Jesus is all you need to be complete, to be brought to maturity. You don't need anything else. Now, in addition to these sorts of things, the false teachers taught a sort of pre-Gnostic heresy. Gnosticism didn't develop fully until later. They said that only the spirit was good and that all matter was evil. And so they denied a couple of cardinal tenets of our faith. They denied the incarnation. Because for God, who is spirit and who is good, to take on a human body would be to take on matter. And all matter is evil. So they denied the incarnation. They also denied that God made the world. Because again, it's the same reason. God, spirit, good, could not create the world that was made of evil matter. These false teachers had their own theory about creation. They taught that God started sending out these emanations or spirits 
much like uh, ripples in a pond if you threw a, a rock into the world. So these spirits, these emanations started coming out of God, and the first ones were pretty good. But later ones became more neutral and then eventually worse and worse until one of these emanations got so evil, so bad, that it actually created the world. And so in their view, Jesus was just one of these emanations. And so Paul's point in this passage, his purpose in this text is to say to the Colossians that Jesus is not just an emanation that came out of God or something far removed from the character of God, but that he's God himself, wrapped in human flesh. Now to make his point, Paul presents Jesus in relation to five things in our text, and here's our outline this morning. He presents Christ in relation, first of all, to God. Secondly, in relation to the universe. Thirdly, in relation to the unseen world. Fourthly, in relation to the church. And then finally, in relation to any and everything else. First of all, he presents Jesus in relation to God. Look at the first part of verse 15. Paul says he is the image of the invisible God. Okay, the false teachers taught that God couldn't enter a body, right? Because matter is evil. And Paul wants to refute this idea. And he says that Christ is the image of God. The Bible tells us that God is invisible, right? Our verse 15 says, says it. He's the image of the invisible God. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.17 says that God is invisible. Now, the Bible also tells us that man was created in the image of God, right? In Genesis 1.27, and then Paul says it again in 1 Corinthians 11.7. But the word image is used in two different ways in the Genesis passage and in the Corinthian passage. And the way we learn its meaning is by the context, right? Words do not have inherent meaning. It's the context that gives them their meaning. Take the word apple. What does apple mean? Well, if I use it in a sentence that says, I want to eat a red delicious apple... But then I use it in another sentence and I say, she is the apple of my eye. Same word, but two different meanings. We determine it by context. That's so important when we study the Bible. Well, when the Bible speaks of man being created in the image of God or bearing God's image, It means that we are created in God's image in terms of personality. We have the ability to think. We have the ability to feel, to decide. And in this sense, we bear God's image. We share in what theologians call the communicable attributes of God. Those are the attributes of God that he communicates with us or shares with us as his creatures. Uh, Things like we just mentioned. But God also has incommunicable attributes. His omniscience, his omnipresence, things like that that we don't as creatures share with him. Now, when someone becomes a Christian then... There's a sense in which he comes into God's image morally as well. Because of the fall, when our man's image of God morally has been marred. But when someone becomes a Christian, when he's converted, he becomes a new creation. Look over at chapter 3 and verse 10. Paul tells us that the image of God is being restored when someone comes to Christ. He says in 3.10, and having put on the new self, 
who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So there's a sense in which that process begins and continues when someone's converted. But Jesus Christ alone is the only absolute, perfect, complete image of God. We read about it in Hebrews. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that Christ is the radiance of God's glory or the setting forth of God's glory. He's the brightness of God's glory, that which comes forth from God to reveal the essence of God. He's the exact representation of his nature or the exact image of God. The substance is the same. So, Paul calls Christ the image of God. The word image, icon, is the Greek word, and it means, I'll try to pronounce this right, similitude, simila, or representation. The idea in our language, in the English language, would be the idea of a stamp or an engraving tool that was used to make an exact representation of something, a replica. Nothing's missing. Nothing is lacking or altered. See, even man in his restored state is still marred. Only Christ is the perfect, adequate image of God. So, we see Christ in relation to God. Secondly, Paul presents Christ in relation to the universe. Look at verse 15 again, the second part. Paul calls him the firstborn of all creation. Now, what does that mean? Well, he can't mean that Christ is part of creation. Because if you look at verse 16, what does the first sentence say? For by him all things were created. Okay, if Christ created all things, he can't be part of creation unless he created himself. And that would be absurd. It's interesting to note in this passage that the Jehovah's Witnesses wrongly add the word other six times in this passage in their New World Translation of the Bible. They say that Christ, that Christ created all other things after he himself was first created. But that's not in the text. The word Paul uses for firstborn in verse 15, when he calls him the firstborn of all creation, is the word protocols. And it's a word that refers to rank or right of authority. It's a reference to position, not to time. The word expresses Christ's priority to and preeminence over creation. It's not a word used in the sense of being the first to be born or created. It's the same word used of God in addressing Israel in the Old Testament as his firstborn. Israel, as, the, as God's firstborn, was the nation that had preeminence among all the nations with God. And so Paul is telling us that Christ is the honored one. He's the prestigious one. He's the heir of the Father. We might say that Christ is the head or the leader of all creation. Now, furthermore, Paul says in verse 16 that Christ created all things. Okay, think about that for a moment. Jesus was the instrumental cause of creation. Think about the size of our universe. A light year is the distance light travels in one year. And the nearest star is four light years away. Our own galaxy is 100,000 light years across. 
There are galaxies that are 70 million light years away from our galaxy and are receding at 200 million miles an hour. And verse 16 says that he commanded it and spoke it into being, just like that. Look at verse 17. Paul says, he is before all things. Okay, he's always been. He's always existed. He never had a beginning. From everlasting to everlasting, the Alpha and the Omega. He also says that in Him all things hold together. That's amazing. Not only is Jesus the instrumental cause in creation, but He's also the conserving cause, the sustaining cause of creation. He created all things and He holds it all together. All things cohere, all things are upheld by the word of his power. So, we see Christ in relation to the universe. Thirdly, we see Christ in relation to the unseen world. Look at verse 16 again. For by him all things were created both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Thrones, dominions, rulers and authorities, they're all different ranks of angels. And Paul is saying that Christ created the angels. And he rules over them. He's not one of them, like the false teachers were saying. Rather, he made them. The false teachers were saying that Christ was not enough. That in addition to Christ, you needed to worship other deities as well. But Paul says in verse 16 that Christ created everything in the unseen world as well. Look at verse 18. Uh, I'm sorry, turn over to chapter 2 and verse 18. <clears throat> Paul says, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of the angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind, and not holding fast to the head. Paul says Christ is all you need. He's all you need. Hold fast to him. He's the one who can bring you to full maturity. He's the one in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found. Fourthly, we see Christ in relation to the church. Back in chapter 1 and look at verse 18. He is also head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Christ is head of the church, an organic thing. Christ is the head, we're the organs. The head gives orders to the body, the head sustains the body. Paul also says that Christ is the beginning in verse 18 of the church. He's the beginning in the sense of source and rank. Christ is the source of the church's life. He's the head or the chief. Paul also calls Christ the firstborn from the dead. Now again, here's our word protocols. A word used in the sense of ranking, not time. It can't mean that Christ was the firstborn from the dead in the sense of time because there were a lot of people raised before Christ was, right? Think of people in the Old Testament that were raised from the dead. Think of Lazarus, whom Jesus himself raised. Protocos means rank or right of authority. Of all those ever risen from the dead, Jesus is the chief. 
He's the number one. He's the leading one. He has the preeminence. Christ was the first to rise with an immortal body. Everybody else raised from the dead died again, except for Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says that he is the first fruits of those who die, since unlike others, he rose never to die again. Well, Paul continues. He says in verse 18, so that he himself might come to have first place in everything. Christ has the preeminence in all things. Finally, Paul presents Christ in relation to everything else. Look at verse 19. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. It's almost as if Paul's saying at this point, in case I left anything out, let me cover all of my bases. And he tells us that it's all in Christ. The power and attributes of sovereignty weren't distributed among emanations. Rather, they're all in Christ. In him, all the fullness of deity dwells. Fullness simply means to be full of, to be wholly occupied with, completely under the influence of. It's the idea of completeness. The fullness of God dwelt in Christ. So, we see Christ in relation to God. We see him in relation to the universe. We see him in relation to the unseen world. We see him in relation to the church. And we see him in relation to everything else. So an obvious question for all of us is, is he preeminent? in our lives? Is he preeminent in our relationships? Is he preeminent in the way we spend our time? Is he preeminent in the things that we pursue? Now notice the peace, the reconciliation that Christ gives to those who come to him. Look at verse 20. And through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Are you at peace with God? Have you made peace through the blood of his cross? There had to be blood. There had to be death, right? The wages of sin is death. Either I'm going to die for my sin or someone else dies for my sin. I want to close with a point that was written by a man named Frederick Pitt many, many years ago. And I think the poem is a beautiful picture and captures the essence of this passage. The creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, becomes part of the creation that he made in order to redeem the creatures. It's called the maker of the universe, and it goes like this. I think it was later uh, put in the format of a hymn. The maker of the universe as man, for man was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree 
on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face by his decree was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rock his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But a new glory crowns his brow and every knee to him must bow. Have you bowed the knee to him? Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed, are you at peace with God through the blood of the cross? There's no other way. The creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, became one of us in order to live a life that you could never live, that I could never live, and in order to die a death and pay a debt that we could never pay. Have you come to him? If you haven't, you can right now. Pray like this in your heart. Lord Jesus, you are the creator of the universe. Thank you that you became one of us in order to live a perfect life and to die a death that I should die. Come into my heart right now. Cleanse me. Give me the gift of eternal life. And from this day moving forward, give me the strength to live a life that honors you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.